Welcome to From Amiens to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, Nicholas Rowe stars in From Amiens to Armistice, A General Reflects, a drama based on the First World War diaries of General Lord Rawlinson, with thanks to the Churchill Archive Centre, Churchill College, University of Cambridge. General Lord Rawlinson was born in London in 1864. His father, Sir Henry Rawlinson, was a member of Parliament and a renowned Oriental scholar. He had served as an army officer with the British East India Company in Persia, Afghanistan and Ottoman Arabia. His son, Henry, followed his father into the army. In 1884, after passing out from the Royal Military College Sandhurst, he joined the King's Royal Rifle Corps in India. He served under Lord Kitchener, first in the Sudan campaign and then in the South African War, where he held a field command with distinction. Lord Kitchener wrote of Rawlinson, He possesses the qualities of staff officer and column commander in the field. His characteristics will always ensure him a front place in whatever he sets his mind to. When Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914, Rawlinson was made Director of Recruiting at the War Office. He worked there until September, when he was sent to France to take command of two divisions of the British Expeditionary Force, 7th and 8th Infantry, 4th Corps. In October 1914, he was promoted to command 4th Corps itself, and in January 1916, assumed command of the new 4th Army. Rawlinson served throughout the First World War, becoming best known for his roles in the Battle of the Somme in 1916 and the Battle of Amiens in 1918. In 1919 he was raised to the peerage and in 1920 made Commander-in-Chief India, a post he held until his death in Delhi in 1925 at the age of just 61. We join General Sir Henry Rawlinson on the Western Front on the evening of the armistice. Monday, the 11th of November, 1918. The armistice was signed this morning and hostilities ceased at 11am. Our cavalry posts are just up to the Belgian frontier. This complete victory is wonderful. Germany is breaking up into a series of independent republics. The Kaiser has gone to Holland. I would never have hoped to attain this degree of success in just three short months after our achievements at Amiens on the 8th of August. Last Thursday, the German emissaries came into the 1st French Army near Guise to get the armistice terms. That same day, I heard from General Davidson, known to us as Tavish, that the Bosch fleet had mutinied at Kiel and that half the ships had hoisted the red flag of Bolshevism. The German delegates were sent on to General Debenet's headquarters, where they arrived tired, hungry and humble. From there... They were at once sent on by special train to the headquarters of Marshal Foch at Saint-Lys. At 11 a.m., Foch, as commander-in-chief of the Allied forces, handed the German delegates the armistice terms. He gave them 72 hours until today, the 11th of November, at 11 a.m., to make up their minds. The German delegates found it necessary to refer the terms to their government at Berlin. However, In view of the mutiny in their fleet at Kiel, I did not see how they could possibly do otherwise than accept. Saturday the 9th of November was a perfectly lovely autumn day, without a cloud in the sky. I took the opportunity to take the small motor out. Our line had advanced a good distance beyond Aven, but there were many craters in the roads, and all bridges had been destroyed. That night, the news came in that the Kaiser had abdicated, and that a regency would be formed. It was beginning to look as if there might be an armistice. 
However, we were still waiting to hear back from the German delegates. It turned out that their courier had been delayed. He had been shot at twice by German rear guards. On the Sunday, I met Poincaré, the French president at Landrecy. Before I arrived, he had made a very laudatory speech to the assembled crowd, praising the work of the British army in the highest terms. That evening, I heard through my intelligence officers that a wireless message had been taken in from Germany telling her delegates to sign the armistice, but making certain reservations in regard to food. There had been severe food shortages in Germany. I called up Foch's headquarters to ask what foundation there was for this intelligence. Apparently, orders to sign the armistice had been received, and intelligence general headquarters said that the Kaiser and the Crown Prince had arrived in Holland with ten motors, followed by a trainload of loot. Who could even have predicted this a couple of months ago? It is wonderful and most satisfactory. Thus ends the greatest war in history. The German Empire has crumbled to dust in its effort to rule the world. The pertinacity and determination of the British Empire is primarily what has brought this about. But the war might have gone on two more years if Germany had not forced the Americans to join by declaring unrestricted submarine war, and had she been less brutal in her methods. Although I think we should have won in the end. I remember so clearly that summer of 1914, when war erupted across Europe. I had been on leave and returned to London to take up the post of Director of Recruiting at the War Office. This appointment had been offered me before the war was thought of, but I had been disinclined to accept it, having hoped for more active employment. When the organisation of the Expeditionary Force was made up, and much to my disappointment my name did not appear amongst those selected for command, I decided to go into the War Office. My omission from the Expeditionary Force was a serious disappointment, and I could only attribute it to the fact that Sir John French had been displeased with my handling of the 3rd Division at manoeuvres the previous year. To introduce a personal matter into his choice of commanders was, in my opinion, petty, but there was nothing to do but submit with the best grace I could. When Lord Kitchener was appointed Secretary of State for War, my hopes revived and I was not sorry to find myself once again working under his direct orders. The first thing Lord Kitchener did on taking office was to appeal to the country for 100,000 men. That gave me plenty to do. At first, recruits came but slowly. Then, by dint of word and advertisement, and canvassing in the provinces, we gradually worked up local enthusiasm till we obtained our 100,000 men in rather less than a fortnight. The atrocities committed by the Germans in Belgium, coupled with the retirement of the Allied armies in northern France, had a marked effect on the country. The daily rate at which recruits came in gradually rose. The large centres of population soon became alive to the seriousness of the war. Employers began giving bounties to their employees to enlist, until at the beginning of September our daily average had reached 33,000 recruits. By the evening of the 6th of September, total recruits numbered an astonishing 354,000. The work was hard and kept me at the office from nine in the morning till eleven at night, but it was full of interest. Although I greatly regretted not having been present at the battles during the retirement of our armies towards Paris, I had been doing my little bit to help to make an army, which one day would drive the Germans back over the Rhine but I did not have long to wait before my wish for more active employment was granted. On the 9th of September, I heard from the then Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Sir Charles Douglas, that I was to be given command of 7th and 8th Infantry Division's 4th Corps. Hurrah! That same day, we reached a total of 435,000 recruits. Just over a week later, on the 20th of September, I left Waterloo at 10.30pm for the ordinary boat to Le Havre. It was a rough passage, but I was quite comfortable in bed. On arrival in France, two Rolls-Royce cars met us on the quay. 
We packed our luggage in and flew off through the pretty red town. We lunched with the consul, who had spent many years in Persia and was therefore familiar with my name. My father had spent many years in Persia with the British East India Company. It was a very cold drive to Paris, with rain and hail showers all the way. There were many stoppages to examine our papers, as there had been Germans in disguise about the place. They had been caught and shot the week before we arrived. We reached Paris about eight in the evening and put up at the Hotel Terminus. I sent off to the military governor to get permits for us to go through to General Sir John French's headquarters the following morning early. I left Paris soon after 7 a.m., reaching general headquarters about 10.30 a.m., after several contretemps. Sir John informed me that he had wired to Lord Kitchener to say he wanted me to take command of the 4th Infantry Division. I was, of course, delighted, as it just fits in until the 4th Corps comes out. I dined comfortably, arranged motors for the following day, and retired to my room to write. Soon after 10 in the evening, Lord Esher, who had been much involved with reforming the military, turned up. We sat for one and a half hours talking over the situation. I gave him many messages to convey to Lord Kitchener on his return, regarding the situation at the front, the disposal and future policy of the new Kitchener armies, and the general conduct of the campaign, which we concluded had been satisfactory thus far. Lord Kitchener had been an enormous asset, and I thought he would become yet more valuable as the war progressed. He had the confidence of the nation and could do pretty well what he liked. I thought the war would go on, at least until Kitchener's volunteer armies were fit to take the field. Little did I know then that this war, the greatest conflict the world has ever seen, would go on long after Kitchener's armies had joined battle and that Kitchener himself would perish at sea before two years were out. In early June 1916, his ship hit a German mine as he was en route to Russia for negotiations. I remember hearing the news. I was on the Western Front at the time, preparing for the Somme offensive. By then, Douglas Haig had taken over from Sir John French as Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Force, and I was commanding the 4th Army. We had been planning the offensive for months and were pretty confident of some success. On the eve of what was to become one of the bloodiest days of the conflict, I recorded in my diary, 30th of June, 1916. This afternoon, one of the 9th Lancers, attached to the French General Headquarters, turned up for a talk. He says the French are most optimistic about the 4th Army attack and have great admiration for the way it has been prepared. They look for great things from it and are most anxious that the French Army shall participate. I think they are over-sanguine but this is their way. The issues at stake in tomorrow's battle are as great, if not greater, than any army action we have yet fought during the war. What the actual results will be, no one can say, but I feel pretty confident of success myself, only after heavy fighting. That the Bosch will break and a debacle will supervene, I do not believe. But should this be the case, I am quite ready to take full advantage of it. The weather has greatly improved and all looks hopeful, but the issues are in the hands of the bon dieu. How misplaced was our confidence. Fortune did not favor us on the 1st of July, 1916. Our seven-day-long bombardment failed to destroy the German artillery leaving our infantry exposed to enemy fire as they advanced across no man's land towards the German trenches. That day, we suffered over 57,000 casualties, said to be the highest number ever sustained in a single day in the history of the British Army. So began 141 days of desperate fighting, until offensive operations were finally called off in the November. We learned much from our costly mistakes during the great Battle of the Somme. We put this knowledge to good use earlier this year when preparing for Amiens, where, once again, we found ourselves fighting over the same terrain. My headquarters for Amiens were at the Chateau de Flixecourt, 
some 20 miles from the Chateau de Carrier, where my headquarters had been for the Somme, and about 30 miles from the front. Flixicourt was a lively little town, halfway between Abbeville and Amiens, on the main railway route from the coast. It was popular with the troops, who used to fill its jolly cafes and estaminets. We always had lots of troops, British and Empire, passing through or attending the various training schools in the town. I moved to Flixicourt at the beginning of April this year so as to relieve the congestion in the forward area. Our quarters in the chateau were most comfortable, and the telephones much better than at my previous headquarters. The day after my arrival, I received a visit from Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister. He came to see me at three o'clock in the afternoon and brought me a case of chocolates. I gave him an account of the situation, telling him that I hoped to accomplish the impossible. The railway junction at Amiens was vital for transporting our supplies and troops to and from the front. With three brigades of Australians in reserve on my front, I thought we ought to be able to keep the Bosch out of Amiens. The Bosch had been keeping up a relentless artillery barrage. Report on destruction of Amiens. From the 22nd of March to the 31st of May, 8,000 shells have been fired on Amiens and approximately 800 bombs from aerial torpedoes. 237 people have been killed and 361 wounded. 2,567 houses, in other words, one in every 10 houses in Amiens, have been hit, one in every 14 damaged and one in every 33 entirely destroyed. The planning for Amiens was accomplished in just over three weeks and amidst the greatest secrecy, lest the Bosch get wind of our plans. It was to be a combined attack with artillery, tanks, infantry, cavalry and aircraft all working together. It was in mid-July that I put my idea for an offensive east of Villa Bretonneur and south of the Somme to Hague. I would need the Canadians, I said. To my surprise and delight... I found Haig had already decided to do this as soon as he could get General Godley and his four divisions back from the French. Haig seemed to think that the Bosch would not continue fighting through the winter of 1918 and would probably do his utmost to come to terms in the autumn, especially if he failed in Champagne, as seemed probable then. I had great hopes that the offensive could be a big thing and a useful factor if peace talks were to begin. The only difficulty would be getting enough divisions and keeping the thing secret. On the 18th of July, I was told that my scheme for the offensive had been approved, and that I could continue my preparations. I then briefed General Sir Arthur Curry, the Canadian Corps commander, and General Monash, commander of the Australian Corps, setting them to work, preparing their schemes. On the 25th of July, Haig came over to tell me that Marshal Foch, commander-in-chief of the Allied forces, had approved my scheme and allocated General Debenet's French troops to participate in the attack. Foch was in capital form, and had been much pleased with the results of the French counter-attack at the Marne. Secrecy was of paramount importance, and I took all sorts of precautions to ensure that our objective was concealed from our own people as well as the Bosch. Hospitals and ambulances are the most difficult things to keep secret. By the 28th, General Headquarters were beginning to fuss, they wanted us to accelerate the date for the beginning of the offensive by 48 hours. I agreed to this after consulting corps commanders. I learned that Foch was expecting us to get well beyond the line of the old Amiens defences, which I rather doubted we could manage. It would depend entirely on effecting a surprise. On account of that, I had said nothing to the cavalry or to the quartermaster and medical services, as they talk so. I inspected the ground between villers Bretonneux and Cachy, where the Canadians would have to form up. There was plenty of room for the artillery, the forming-up units and the tanks. The Canadians would therefore have no difficulty in getting in their artillery, but they would have to be careful about keeping direction in the dark. The whole sector had become extraordinarily quiet, with not a soul to be seen, and no shelling at all although I got shelled at when I was in villers Bretonneux, A splinter hit the car, but luckily there was no damage, except to a mule that was killed. By the end of July, the tank programme was complete, although time was short for training the Canadians. 
We would be well off for tanks. Third Corps would have 221 supply tanks, Australian Corps 30 and the Canadians 42, and there would be plenty of fighting tanks for all. I organised a tank demonstration for Haig at Vaux. It was very hot, not a breath of air. The Australians did their work well. Haig was much impressed with the new drill that used tanks with infantry, particularly the speed and elan of the infantry coupled with the speed and hardiness of the tanks. On the morning of the 2nd of August, the Bosch shelled Amiens for some hours. The previous day, his air activity had been very marked. I began to wonder if he had smelled a rat. The Bosch had also been showing signs of nervousness in the Albert sector. That afternoon, patrols were sent out between Albert and Denoncourt. It turned out that the Bosch had cleared out of Albert and Denoncourt and retired behind the Ancre, putting the river between us, so as to prevent our using tanks against them. On the 4th of August, I attended early service and church. It was the fourth anniversary of the declaration of war and a special day for intercession. News was coming in from all parts of despondency amongst the German people and in the ranks of the Bosch army. If fortune favoured us on the 8th of August, a marked success in the field could have a far-reaching effect. We had started all sorts of hares running and stories about moves of troops up to Ypres and down to Champagne so as to confuse people as much as possible. The day before the battle, I went round the Canadian division I was immensely pleased with the fine spirit they showed. If any troops could smash the Bosch, they would. But they had no easy task to start with. All would be well if the three divisions succeeded in getting rifle wood. We had eight excellent divisions and 300 tanks ready against the Bosch in perfect tank country and three divisions of cavalry to press through any hole that was made. There was nothing to show that the Bosch knew what was coming south of the Somme and I had great hopes that we might win a big success. On the 8th of August, we attacked at 4.20am with 3rd Australian and Canadian Corps. I was not able to get to the front as I was glued to the telephone. All went exceedingly well. We captured over 10,000 prisoners and at least 202 guns. The Canadians did splendidly and the Australians even better. Cavalry, too, did splendid work. The initial surprise went far to ensure success, but the spirit of the colonial infantry was probably the decisive factor. I was very proud of having commanded so magnificent an army in this historic battle, a record for the war as regards the successes of the first two days. A few days later, his Majesty the King, accompanied by Foch and Haig, visited the front. I met His Majesty at Molien au Bois, where Generals Pershing and Bliss were present with the 22nd American Division. His Majesty took them to a private room to decorate them with the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. I then took the King to Carrier to see Third Corps. The King lunched on the hill overlooking the Somme Valley before coming on to Villers Bretonneur, where I joined him again. I took him to Amiens, where he saw the destruction and visited the cathedral. I think the king enjoyed his visit. He seemed interested and in very good spirits. On his return, he sent us a heartwarming cable of congratulation. My warmest congratulations and thanks to yourself, your staff and all ranks under your command for the magnificent success recently gained by the Fourth Army. The brilliant manner in which the operation was prepared and successfully carried out, with comparatively small losses, by the Third Australian and Canadian Corps, in conjunction with the Cavalry Corps, RAF and Tank Corps, pays tribute to the skill of the leaders of all ranks and the bravery of the individual soldier as well as to the high state of efficiency of the staffs and departmental services concerned. The gallant and skillful cooperation of the armoured cars and motor machine gun batteries is worthy of the highest praise. Please convey to all ranks my appreciation and thanks.
G.R. We did not know then that Amiens would begin the final chapter of the Great War, although I think Haig believed it would be. I remember well his special order of the 7th of September, 1918. One month has now passed since the British armies, having successfully withstood all attacks of the enemy, took the offensive in their turn. In that short space of time, by a series of brilliant and skillfully executed actions, our troops have repeatedly defeated the same German army whose vastly superior numbers compelled our retreat last spring. What has happened on the British front has happened also on the front of our allies, less than six months after the launching of the great German offensive, which was to have cut the Allied front in two. The Allied armies are everywhere today advancing victoriously side by side over the same battlefields on which, by the courage and steadfastness of their defence, they broke the enemy's assaults. Yet more has been done. Already we have pressed beyond our old battle lines of 1917 and have made a wide breach in the enemy's strongest defences. In this glorious accomplishment, all ranks of all arms and services of the British armies in France have borne their part in the most worthy and honourable manner. The capture of 75,000 prisoners and 750 guns in the course of four weeks' fighting speaks for the magnitude of your effort and the magnificence of your achievement. My thanks are due to all ranks of the fighting forces for their indomitable spirit in defence and their boldness in attack, to all commanders and their staff officers under whose able direction such great results have been attained and also to all those whose unsparing labours behind the actual fighting line have contributed essentially to our common success. To have commanded this splendid army, which at a time of grave crisis has so ably done its duty, fills me with pride. We have passed through many dark days together. Please God, these never will return. The enemy has now spent his efforts, and I rely confidently upon each one of you to turn to full advantage the opportunity which your skill, courage, and resolution have created. Douglas Haig, Commander-in-Chief, British Armies in France, General Headquarters, September the 7th, 1918. Looking back now, it seems incredible that all this should have come to pass. We owe it to three things, to the spirit of the troops. Their recovery after the German offensives of this spring is a glorious testimony to British grit. To the way old Foch pulled the operations of the Allies together, and to Haig's faith in victory this year. He believed in it long before I did, and when all the people at home were talking about plans for 1919. He not only believed in it, but went out for it, and he must be a proud and thankful man today. I have written him a letter of congratulation. I have been looking at the figures of the Fourth Army since the 8th of August. We captured 79,000 prisoners and 1,100 guns, and our casualties numbered 110,000. I have commanded British Australians, Canadians, South Africans, and Americans. If we make a proper peace, it is with these peoples that the future of the world should rest. From Amiens to Avan has been a wonderful story. I may live to write it some day. From Amiens to Armistice, A General Reflects, was a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. General Sir Henry Rawlinson and the narrator were played by Nicholas Rowe. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The script consultant was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn, and the executive producer was Simon Bendry. 
with thanks to the Churchill Archive Centre, Churchill College, University of Cambridge. In our next podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn on the Western Front, where he considers how the Battle of the Somme in 1916 influenced the way the war was fought in 1918.